Well, thank you, and uh, it, it's an honour and a pleasure to, to be here. I wasn't expecting the kind of numbers we have today, so I'm delighted uh, that there's such an interest in the topic. Um, it seems like the last 72 hours have been the perfect example of out of the frying pan and into the fire. It was out of the uh, 25 degree heat in uh, Cancun onto several airplanes and back into um, the political hot water that we have here in Ireland uh, at the moment and uh, uh, actually straight back into a lot of discussions around uh, climate change and the legislation which is expected to be uh, published before uh, Christmas. So um, I guess what I'd like to talk to is maybe the politics around the discussions and the deliberations in uh, Cancun. Uh, I'm not uh, an expert on the uh, technical aspects of, of the discussions, uh, but I do want to talk in general about uh, what happened in Cancun, certainly uh, as I saw it, where we were there. I think the expectations couldn't have been lower for Cancun, and I think that was very deliberate. Uh, after the, the um, huge interest and hype around the Copenhagen discussions a year ago, I think everyone knew that politically the, the whole uh, expectations had to be dampened down in order to have any realistic uh, chance of success. And I don't think anybody expected a miracle at this year's meeting. Um, but against those odds, uh, the near impossible did happen. And we had, I think, 191 countries signing off on texts relating to the Kyoto Protocol and long-term cooperative action. Uh, and as I said at the time, it didn't save the planet, but it did save the process. Uh, and I think there was a very real fear in the room that the process could simply have fallen apart in, in the hours on Friday evening and even early on Saturday morning uh, in Cancun. Um, and given that the, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, has been around for a decade at this stage, I think there is renewed hope that next year's meeting in South Africa will produce a legally binding international agreement. Uh, in essence, it's an incremental but a very significant step forward. If you look back to uh, 12 months ago, many, many countries said no because the deal went too far. And this year, by, in contrast, one country, Bolivia, opted out of the consensus saying that the proposals weren't strong enough. Uh, and I think that, that was, for me, one of the most telling aspects of what happened in, in Mexico this year. And I agree, in essence, with what Bolivia was saying. We need to go further and faster to tackle greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but look, while I agree with the sentiment, uh, uh, and they said very clearly, look, the agreements uh, still allow warming of somewhere between three and four degrees to happen to the planet. If we hadn't had any agreement, uh, it would have been a, a complete disaster. Now, Bolivia um, uh, occupied the, the, the discussion and the debate of most of the Friday evening and Saturday morning. Uh, the other aspect of what Bolivia was saying was that they completely dismissed the use of market-based instruments to tackle climate change. And I think um, certainly a good 180 out of the 191 countries there would strongly believe in using market-based <coughs> instruments to tackle climate change. And there was a point uh, Pat Finnegan from the Irish NGO Grian made to me, is, is the market works very well to tackle climate change, and we need to use market-based in instruments as part of that process. Um, the texts refer to keeping global temperatures increases to less than 2 degrees Celsius and to consider moving the goal to a more ambitious limit of less than 1.5 degrees. So couched in the text, even though if you, if you interpret them on, on a broad basis, it could be 3 or 4 degrees, there certainly is the intention to try and bring us down towards 1.5 degrees. Um, I mean, talking to the average person on the street, that doesn't sound like much, but... Um, Obviously, we, we, uh, that's a global average, and in certain countries that will lead to very dramatic rises in uh, temperature, but also more extreme weather events, uh, and even minor climate changes can wipe out the livelihood or the crops within uh, some countries. It was interesting uh, in the period that I was there that we had the Europe, uh, European Union's um, uh, commissioner uh, with responsibility for um, uh, addressing climate change, Connie Hedegaard, uh, she, she, along with the current Flemish chair of the EU Environmental uh, Council, led the coordination meetings for the Union 
that took place at crucial points in the negotiations. Um, and I felt that uh, and th those meetings took place uh, literally within a tent on, on, I think, a tennis court in, in this massive resort hotel. Uh, and by the by, that, that resort hotel, I guess, showed up everything that is challenging in climate change, that the, the hotel complex, uh, an intimate uh, hotel with 2,300 bedrooms, uh, is located in a cleared-away mangrove swamp uh, beside, uh, beside the, the Gulf of Mexico and is based at, um, I, I guess, mostly Americans who jet down uh, for, I don't know, the American Association of Undertakers annual <laughs> conference. Um, and it kind of shows what, what, what's the, the challenge uh, of what needs to be uh, done there. But uh, I digress. The, 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 what was interesting about the European Union, that there are, of course, um, very different opinions within the European Union, um, clearly a kind of a fault line between East and West with a few countries like Italy finding themselves on the eastern side of that divide. And you could see that Commissioner Hedegaard was trying very hard to keep um, Europe speaking with one voice, and she reiterated this time and time again. I think the, the Thursday morning, uh, the big concern was Russia, and the, the dialogue was, well, who can talk to Russia, who, 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 who can... Uh, in a sense, speak their language both literally and metaphorically. And uh, Finland and, and Poland were head, heading off to have a bilateral with, or to, to sit down with Russia. And then there was the concern of, oh, Poland's talking to Russia. Uh, so you could see the tensions within the European uh, camp, and I think that was that was uh, showed that there is a huge challenge even within the European Union to, to speak with one voice. And I saw that. Uh, a month and a half ago when I represented Mr Gormley at a meeting of the European Environment Council in Luxembourg. But I think, thankfully, the Union did speak with one voice and I think uh, there was a very strong lead <coughs> given by Europe within the discussions uh, and a lot of bilaterals uh, to try and make sure that uh, all those countries uh, were uh, on board. And I think it opens up the possibility of the European Union stepping up to the 30% target rather than the 20% uh, that is enshrined in directives uh, currently. Obviously, there's a clear fault line as well between developed and developing uh, countries. And for that reason, the Green Climate Fund has been set up to provide assistance to the more vulnerable countries. Framing the institutional architecture of this fund is quite a challenge, and there was a lot of raised voices around this. Uh, for the first three years, the World Bank will act as the trustee to the fund. Uh, obviously, a lot of developing countries uh, were, didn't want to see that happen, particularly Bolivia. Um, but the composition of the fund's committee uh, is carefully balanced across the continents, and it ensures, for instance, that the small island states are represented there. And the fund assists countries in adapting to climate change and will have access to significant funding over the next uh, decade. Uh, but a key issue there, I think, and again, um, uh, some Irish NGOs were pointing this out, that increasing the capa capacity building, providing capacity building in those countries is a crucial issue that hasn't been fully resolved. I mean, in essence, these are exchanges of capital and assistance, uh, but what about these very small countries that simply need to be upskilled and given the resources to both uh, tease out the issues and, and provide an adequate uh, response to them? Uh, over those few days as well, Ireland uh, announced the provision of fast start financing for the most vulnerable developing countries. We've announced a commitment of €23 million Euro as Ireland's com contribution for 2010. Uh, some, uh, some might argue, and I, I think some did argue on the airwaves here at home while I was away, that money shouldn't be going abroad at a time of economic austerity at home. Uh, but I would strongly say that this funding will help some of the most impoverished nations to adapt to a crisis for which we share responsibility. The, the dynamic of the, the final plenary session was, was fascinating. I mean, tensions were running very high in the hall that night. Uh, even when the Mexican Foreign Minister, Patricia Espinosa, came into the room, she received a standing ovation in advance of the agreement for the work that had gone on over the last year. And, you know, while I wasn't party to, to, to that work over the year, I do feel that Mexico seemed to be very well placed with, the, um, with a lot of developing countries 
directly to the south of Mexico and with the uh, very developed country of the US and Canada to the north. So I think in terms of reaching out, uh, I think there was a lot more listening from Mexico and maybe in the case of last year, uh, Denmark and, and a lot of European countries were in a sense saying, look, these are the facts, this is the science, we must move. So perhaps not enough, uh, not enough listening. Uh, though at a personal level, I certainly am very impressed with um, Commissioner Hedegaard and, and the efforts that she went to. But somehow I think even just the, the sheer raw geography of Mexico's position almost allowed them to provide stronger links between uh, the developed and the uh, developing world. Um, and I, I was certainly impressed with Minister Espinosa uh, and with Commissioner Hedegaard uh, and indeed many of the others, uh, the NGOs uh, and others who were there. Uh, former Irish President Mary Robinson was there earlier uh, in the week with, with uh, the her new climate justice uh, group. Uh, and I think there was a real sense in the room of can we please achieve an agreement and there was almost palpable sighs of relief when um, the statements from China, Japan, um, some of the oil states, Saudi Arabia came on board in the early hours of the morning and gave their approval uh, to, the, to the agreement. Um, late, late on Friday evening the, the Environment Minister of the Maldives, Mohammed Aslam, addressed the floor. Uh, he said, I speak for a country whose survival depends on the decisions we take. No one can doubt my interest in this matter. The text is the best we can do right now and there is room to improve things next year. And in a sense, he summed up the views of the room. Uh, there was uh, a essentially a filibustering attempt by, the, by, the, uh, by Bolivia. Uh, at one stage, there was booze in the room from, from the national delegations uh, directed towards Bolivia, which I, I thought showed the the very strong feeling in the room that if there wasn't an agreement, everything would uh, fall apart. What do I think of the agreement itself? I think it's weak. I, I, I think it's really l not that much more than an intention to, to make pro progress over the next uh, 12 months in the lead-in uh, to South Africa. Um, however, I do think that there is uh, a certain amount of substance in there uh, and it, it couldn't have been stronger in order to get the, the vast majority of both developed countries and developing countries on board. It does, I think, for the first time, touch on the need of developing countries to reduce their emissions over time. Um, maybe there's not a strong enough <coughs> reference to peaking within, uh, within the agreements. Nonetheless, that was a very live issue throughout the discussions of Look, developing countries' emissions are increasing, developed countries, but let's look at, uh, start to look at what years we need to see a peak occur, and obviously a differentiation between the, the years of peaking in both the developed and uh, the developing world. A couple of other issues that I flagged in my address to the plenary. Um, one issue that was flagged by, by Minister, the Finance Minister, Brian Lenehan, uh, during his budget speech last week, uh, was that there is a need to move away from the narrow metric of GDP as a method of me measuring prosperity. And we are tasking the Central Statistics Office with the need to, with developing a new national welfare index that will reflect quality of life as well as economic indices. And I think there's a str strong mood for that in the current um, social environment and economic climate in Ireland that we, we need to simply start to move away from those fairly narrow metrics. Other countries are starting to do that. Sarkozy uh, announced a similar move in France, I think, within the last year or so. Uh, and I think that will help us in the discussion of the need to, to uh, target uh, carbon emissions. Um, we also, I, I, I spoke about um, uh, working with the United Nations Environment Programme and the World Resources Institute uh, to do some research to address a few of the more pressing issues in the negotiations uh, over that, that were still live in the negotiations. Um, that uh, will work will happen over the next um, uh, first part of the year and will be presented at the bond session in June of next year. Um, here at home, 
we are currently finalising a legislative proposal that will provide the statutory backing for our immediate and medium-term mitigation targets and our longer-term transition uh, objective. Our outlook is progressive and the legislation will provide clarity and certainty for all <coughs> stakeholders. That legislation is being progressed as a matter of urgency. Uh, I expect it to be in place in the early part of next year. Um, there, the, obviously, this, this work is happening at a high level within the Department of the Environment, uh, but also within the uh, Department of Finance and the Attorney General's Office. Um, so that is on track uh, at the moment, and I'm looking forward to a, a robust discussion of, of the uh, bill uh, on, on its publication. Uh, I think we're all looking for clarity. We're all looking for certainty. For certainty. I think we may uh, agree to disagree on exactly what measures should be in there, uh, but it is certainly a commitment in our programme for government uh, that we intend to deliver on uh, before, uh, before leaving office. A couple of other issues. Um, the, the 23 million euro contribution from Ireland uh, goes, into the, the, goes towards the Global Climate Change Alliance um, and I see that as a, a very important uh, signal of intent. Uh, we, we did, we may, on, on Taoiseach Brian Cowan at Copenhagen committed 100 million euro I think over a three year period. Uh, I'm glad to say that at a, at a time of significant austerity and economic challenge here at home that we are making this uh, commitment this year. Uh, I think it is a, a strong gesture of intent that will uh, change lives dramatically uh, in the developing world. That, that is more or less where things stood. Um, just looking at some of the commentary since uh, on coming back from uh, Cancun, uh, I think there is a feeling from, from some business interests that what happened at Cancun doesn't change things dramatically in the short term, but I think it does set us on the road to very significant medium and long-term action. And I think the discussion uh, and the view that has been expressed in certain quarters that this allows the European Union to uh, step up, to perhaps step up to the 30% target by 2020, I think, for me, is the real, uh, the real effect of, of what happened uh, in Cancun. Uh, and look, there are, there are many obstacles out there. Um, but I, I don't think anyone would have forgiven us for, for failure uh, in Mexico. And I'm certainly heartened and upbeat <coughs> from those discussions. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to how things develop over, over the next 12 months. Thank you. Thank you, Minister.